This is Frank Islam, Chairman and CEO of FY Investment Group and your host of Washington Calling, where we interview leading voices from business, politics, that impact you, the viewer. Today, we are fortunate to have a distinguished guest, and his name is Dr. Srinath Reddy. Dr. Reddy is the President of Public Health Foundation of India. He was a professor of cardiovascular health at Harvard School of Public Health, and now he serves as an adjunct Professor at Harvard. He's also on the advisory board of many, many national, international organizations. Thank you for coming to our show, Dr. Reddy. It's wonderful to see you and wonderful to meet you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be on your show, sir. Thank you very much. So, Dr. Reddy, um, I, I, I kind of borrowed uh, something from, uh, uh, from CBS News uh, two days ago. Uh, and the question was, uh, uh, it's not a Walter Cronkite or someone else. Uh, David Rubenstein was the one who said that. Please tell us who you are personally and physically, and 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 uh, why did you change your career from a cardiologist to the public health? Mission and health promotion are absolutely critical. They are shaped by many social, environmental, economic, and commercial data of health. At the same time, we recognize that unless we actually promote multidisciplinary learning, which, which can translate into sectoral action for building a healthy society, will continue to produce a lot of disease, which will swamp the hospitals and demand a lot more of healthcare resources. So in order to build a healthy society, we need very strong public health institutions as well not just medical institutions which provide for illness care. So after a good deal of thinking, I shifted my career to building public health institutions in India, which can provide that kind of capacity building in education, research, policy development, and also in terms of health system support to central and state governments who are actually doing the implementation work. So, so, Dr. Reddy, who funds the, your foundations and how do you sustain yourself? Well, uh, the foundation itself uh, started as a public-private initiative, oh, okay. partly funded by the government of India, partly okay. by the Bill and Mel Gil Melinda Gates Foundation, and okay. partly by private so, philanthropy, mainly from the information technology sector. But we have not received any subsequent annual grants from them as a matter of routine. Uh, we have only bid for projects and competitively won the grants. And we survive basically on the strength of those grants that we win, as well as the educational programs that we run. Very good. And of course, I, I, philanthropy when it comes to us. As you know, uh, Dr. Reddy, we have an unprecedented upheaval, a global crisis because of the COVID-19. There are a lot of new cases which are rising rapidly in South Asia, including India and Pakistan. What, what would be the, could be the reason behind this sudden rise and spark? Well, uh, the sudden rise is because the lockdown has been lifted. Initial two stages of the lockdown were fairly strong and fairly rigorously followed as well by the people. But then there were progressive steps of relaxation, and that ensured that there was far greater mobility among people, which allowed the virus to spread. But simultaneously, we have also seen that testing rates go up. And when testing rates go up quite a lot, a lot more new cases are discovered. But having said that, at least as far as India is concerned, it is still very widely prevalent as a problem in some of the bigger cities where the virus is now having an incidence of more new cases as well. Uh, but in some of the parts of India, which are particularly rural as well as the small cities, it is still not much of a problem as yet, but we do need to take a lot of preventive measures. Having said that, the death rates in India are still quite low. If you actually adjust for the population size of India, we will find 
that in India, the cases per million population are 380, whereas in the United States, there are 7,600. Correct. The deaths per million in India are 11.7, .7, whereas in the United States, there are 384. So right, right now, we are still, in a sense, fairly comfortably off in terms of the death rates, but we do need to take a lot of precaution to prevent the virus spreading and causing more havoc. Uh, how do you accept the current situation of the pandemic in India compared to the United States? You mentioned uh, about the statistics, uh, and our China, or even Brazil, uh, India now has the record daily increase, as you mentioned that. Uh, what's the true toll of the coronavirus in India? Well, uh, in, we do have a rising number of cases, as I said, because of the increased testing rates, as well as the spread of the virus in the large cities and the surrounding districts. But many parts of India are still unaffected. Uh, a zero surveillance study done in uh, middle of May in several districts of India showed uh, that the virus had only touched about 0.73% of the population. In the cities, it's going to be larger. But nevertheless, right. the total number of cases adjusted for the population size, as well as the deaths adjusted for the population size, are still on the, in the smaller range compared to Western Europe and the United States. Um, as you know, the, the whole organization, as you mentioned about test, test, as we understand that not many tests are being done in, in the India and the United States, uh, Trump, who's a lunatic, uh, and, and, and what he said about not doing anything, who has no clue about this crisis, he told a rally in Oklahoma not to test anymore. What's your expert to be on testing? Why is it important? What do we need to do to make sure we are proactive uh, on the testing part of that? Well, there are three elements. Who need to be tested needs to be clearly defined. Obviously, right. all symptomatic cases need to be tested. People with a high exposure history of being contacts of active cases or having had travel history from hot zones need to be tested. Now, once we have decided on that and once the lockdown is over, because in the lockdown period, almost everybody was confined home, whether there were cases or contacts. As the lockdown was being opened up, the need for testing went up but which we meant also that we needed to identify all the people with symptoms, preferably with household surveillance, rather than just waiting for them to come and declare themselves uh, to the system. But once the cases were identified with appropriate testing, the next step was not only isolation of the person who was infected, but also very active contact tracing. Contact tracing not only of the persons whom the infected person has met, but also going back to find out where that person got infected in the first place, where the original source also had infected others. So you need to do extensive contact tracing, both prospectively and retrospectively. Unless we do all that, uh, testing is only one component of the package. But we <laughs> have certainly increased the testing rates now, uh, both with uh, RT-PCR as well as with uh, antigen testing. And now we are doing zero surveillance in population samples to find out the extent of spread in both uh, districts as well as in cities. What kind? As I understand that the uh, the the hospital in Delhi, uh, which is the center of the coronavirus, uh, has a lot of challenges because they don't have the facility, they don't have the people to take care of the people. So, what kind of steps you're taking in order for the people to have a test on the road on the rural areas? to make sure that it's effective, it can be taken care of that and make sure that people do get the testing? Well, testing facilities have increased certainly in the cities and the small towns. In rural okay. areas, it's going to be more difficult to get the testing facilities done other than through the zero surveillance studies which are going on. But even there, efforts are being made to try and test as many people as possible or at least isolate people on the basis of their symptoms, which also are fairly uh, significant in terms of uh, providing a diagnostic uh, direction. Uh, but now the other element, of course, is uh, that the people who are mildly uh, symptomatic are being advised care at home. Whereas it's only for moderate 
great, quite seriously ill, hospitalized. Therefore, the pressure on hospitals is now reduced a bit so that only the more serious cases can be taken care of, whereas the less symptomatic people can actually be isolated and managed at home. Do you believe that the, uh, the lockdown has achieved its objective in terms of flattening the curve? And how long this lockdown will continue? Because it does have an effect on, ec on economy as well. Well, uh, it is difficult to say because uh, the flattening the curve could be dependent on what we are measuring. Are we measuring right. the case count, which is going to be very variable according to the uh, testing numbers and the testing criteria? Or are we going to be measuring the death count? I believe it's better to measure the deaths because ultimately that's what matters. And if we count the deaths properly, then we can get an idea of when the death count per day is coming down consistently over 10 days. And then we can say that at least we have gained control over the epidemic. But still, at the moment, the deaths are rising and we have to keep a careful watch on that. So we cannot predict right now what the time period would be for us to gain control especially since large parts of India have not been affected. We hope they will not be affected, but we'll have to wait and see. It will take at least a couple of months for us to get a full picture of how much control we have had in containing the spread as well as quelling the epidemic in the places where it's currently very active. Why does some other Indian states have done very well? For example, Kerala and Karnataka and the other states have not been successfully uh, able to handle this crisis. Why is that? Uh, Kerala has been a great well, example. They have done very well. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, well, actually, states states which have had a good health system in the beginning and have had investments in public health in particular have done well. Uh, the southern states, Kerala, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, as well as even Odisha, have done well. Punjab also is currently doing fairly well. Therefore, states which actually had a well-functioning health system in the steady state prior to the public health emergency could easily build the surge capacity when the public health emergency came. More importantly, with a good tradition of public health, they could do active testing and contact tracing public education, they could bring in citizen volunteers for participating along with the government in a variety of activities, whether it was case identification or contact tracing. Uh, all of this was a me measure in which the citizens also participated. So a strong pre-existing public health system and a culture of citizen participation helps these states whereas other states which had weak health systems to begin with, faltered. Very well said. As I understand, you're a member of the government of India's task force of COVID-19. Tell us a little bit about what you do and why you mentioned there's a low uh, fatality rate in India compared to other countries, and you mentioned that. Why is that the case? Uh, it's just because we have a, you have a great facility, you have a, as well as you're doing the testing, you're doing the social distancing, you're taking the measures to prevent it, correct? Well, uh, basically, I think the task force itself looks at the technical issues of uh, what kind of tests to be employed, what kind of treatment protocols to be developed. They're mainly the technical issues that are looked at. The policy issues are looked at by the ministry and other levels of the government. But I think the reasons why India has had a low mortality rate even if you take into account there could have been some undercounting of deaths, still the death rates are pretty low. And the reason is partly because we have a young population with very small percentage, about 65 years of age. We also have a large rural population. Two thirds of India is still rural. And it's well known that the virus spreads where there is greater degree of people mobility, that is in urban areas. Whereas in rural areas, the mobility is much less. Therefore, the spread of the infection is also much less. But in addition, there have been other factors that have been invoked, whether BCG vaccination, which has been universal for several decades, boosts the sort of uh, non-specific immunity in individuals, 
polio immunization, whether that also plays a role in a similar manner of boosting non-specific immunity. All of these factors have been invoked, but those are hypothetical and need a lot more proof. Some clinical trials are going on now. But I would say right now at this point in time, uh, our younger age as well as the larger rural population segment are the two factors which are most likely playing in our favor. Uh, before we change, uh, before we uh, close our conversation, Dr. Reddy, is there anything that you want to say to the audience that I did not ask you that question be um, before we uh, close the our conversation? Well, I think the next few months are going to be a period of great challenge for India because we need to contain the epidemic as quickly as possible. Uh, in the areas where already there is a fair amount of uh, intensity and protect the areas where the virus has not yet had a major presence. But one of the very pleasing features in recent times has been the experience in the slum in Dharavi in Mumbai. Everybody Correct. prophesied having very tightly packed people in a largest slum of the world uh, is going to be a catastrophe if the virus right. enters. The virus right. did enter, then with very effective public health management and excellent cooperation from the people there, despite the impossibility of doing physical distancing, just with good public health measures like masks, hand washing, the virus was contained very effectively in Dharavi. So we have had heartwarming stories of success, which I believe should be replicated across India and that gives us a good lesson that even poor people in the worst of circumstances, if they are given the right public health message, can stand up and play a very strong role in overcoming the virus. Very well said and very well articulated. So Dr. Reddy, uh, do you see a brighter horizon in the fall uh, uh, as we face out this pandemic and get back to our economy, get back to our work and get back to the uh, the, the thing we should do socially? Well, I think we need to take precautions at least till April next year. We oh need to goodness. get back to work, certainly, but with precautions. I would say with confidence, but caution. We need to rebuild our lives. The reason, the reason is we do not know how this uh, virus will behave in the winter, whether there will be a second wave. We have to still watch it. But I don't think we should allow ourselves to be frightened into a frozen position. We should get on with our lives with all, all the safety, with confidence, but with caution. Very well said. Thank you very much, Dr. Reddy. And this is Frank Islam wishing you a great week. And thank you for watching.